Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to be talking about playfulness. Uh, and basically, I'm going to talk about how do we get from animal play into social play and from there to uh, more complicated things like games and LARPs. Let's start with the fact that uh, play is older than humans. Play is older than culture. It is older than language. It was here already before humans. Uh, it means that uh, animals have not waited for humans to teach them how to play. And although we play in different ways in different cultures, in different, different nations, there is still something that we share. Uh, we have different words in different languages for play, and those words are slightly different, they mean slightly different things, but there is something underneath it that is shared. There is a biological basis to play. Um, it is uh, an ex exaggeration to say that if it has a spine, it plays, but not by much. Uh, humans play, mammals play, um, many other animals play as well. It is very widespread in animal kingdom. Uh, in social constructionism, we would call that a brute fact. Uh, play is something that is, uh, it, although it can be debated, it can't be denied that there is something there. It exists regardless of humans, human culture, and representations thereof. This means that uh, from the point of view of uh, uh, evolution, from an evolutionary theory point of view, uh, play has to have some kind of a benefit. Because if play did not have a benefit, it would not be as widespread in the animal kingdom. It would have been uh, removed at some point because playing is uh, costly. If you are playing in the wild, you are spending time that could be, could be spent looking for food, looking uh, or protecting your offspring, and you are uh, using energy to something that is uh, not directly relevant for survival. So play needs to have a reason, an evolutionary uh, benefit why it still exists in the animal kingdom, and why it is so widespread. However, we don't exactly know what that benefit is. <laughs> it's something that uh, scholars of animal play have been, have been uh, addressing for over a hundred years, and we have some very good theories, but, uh, but uh, we're not quite certain yet uh, if, if they're sort of the final answer. The best one we have at the moment basically says that uh, 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 that play, uh, play, acts, uh, play creates uh, social interactions that can then prove useful. Basically, like mutation works in an organism, play works in social interaction or in interaction in, in, in patterns of, uh, patterns of, uh, of, of, of experiencing the world. Uh, and then there are sort of different theories as to as to sort of when does play emerge and how does it uh, does it emerge how does it emerge, like the surplus theory, uh, uh, surplus energy theory of play, which basically says that in order for there to be play, for animals of any kind, there needs to be first of all uh, enough energy to play. You can't play if you're tired or or, or if you if you're, you're just barely surviving. So basically, you need to have energetics. Uh, you need to be uh, uh, protected from outside threat. Uh, you have to be in some kind of a safe environment, or at least perception of safety needs to be there. Uh, then uh, there are certain uh, sort of species, typical simulation and optimal arousal, basically meaning sort of a psychological and social uh, 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 aspects of, of how play takes place. And then there's a sort of a complex environment which inc influences what kind of play an animal or a human engages in. Scholars of animal play uh, divide play into three very broad categories. The first one is locomotor play, which is play with the body. Uh, it is basically uh, when you get a, a nice feeling of sensation from from playing. For example, if you're spinning until dizzy, 
uh, you get a nice feeling in your body and that's, that's uh, locomotor play, that's, uh, that's play with the body. So is masturbation. So there are sort of, sort of different types of, of things that you do for the sake of doing those things because sort of they give you a nice sensation. The second category is object play, where you play with an object. Uh, for example, you play with a stick or you uh, kick a football around or, or sort of you use a tool for the play. And in, uh, in, in humans, these objects can also be conceptual, so they don't need to be physical. And the third group, the most complex here, is social play, when you're playing with others. Now, of course, most play in humans combines many of these. The picture here is from uh, Tukki Humala or Keppi Känni, which is a Finnish uh, uh, pastime, as I would call it, where sort of you spin around the stick until you feel dizzy. And here, so, so, so you're doing it because it feels nice in the body, but you're using an object, which is the stick, and you're doing it socially. Maybe they're running next, and of course they will be veering in different directions, and it will, it will be fun and embarrassing and, and all, all kinds of things. But sort of, so, so the same play can contain all of these aspects. But uh, sort of, if we look at the sort of, sort of uh, what is play or where does it emerge from, uh, I, like to I, I like to start with uh, playfulness. And this is the mindset, so what is happening in your mind. And this is how I separate play playful things from non-playful things. Playful things are basically things that you do for the sake of doing them. You're not doing those things because you want to achieve a goal, but the actual doing is the thing that you're, you're doing it for. An easy way to separate if you're in a playful mindset or in a goal-oriented mindset is to ask, would you exchange what you're doing for having it done? Would you exchange playing a LARP for having played a LARP? Would you exchange uh, sort of uh, writing a thesis to having written a thesis? Would you exchange sort of hoovering the living room for ha having a clean living room? So sort of uh, that's one way to, to sort of separate sort of if you're doing it uh, in a playful mindset or in a, in a serious mindset or in a goal-oriented mindset. So in a way, sort of the way I describe playfulness is that it's a uh, meta motiva uh, playfulness is a meta motivational state, an attitude. Meta motivational state meaning that it's not an attitude, but it's about attitude. Why is it that you have a certain sort of an attitude towards the world? It is innate to the player. It's something that is in the player, in the, the player's uh, mind, and it's characterized as being voluntary. So it's sort of nobody is forcing you. It's spont often spontaneous, and. Uh, and the, the, uh, uh, the, the activity itself is the primary goal of the activity. It does not have a moral dimension. Play is neither good or bad, play just is. I mean, society can look at an activity and decide whether it's good or bad, but, but play in itself is not a moral category. Uh, Michael J. Apter, a psychologist um, uh, the, whom, from whom I, I draw on this, uh, has this chart which is about uh, differentiating uh, uh, a, 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 a paratelic and telic motivation. So basically playful mindset from a goal-oriented mindset. And then, uh, uh, th then there's this idea that, that when we, are, we, we can get excited, uh, we, can be sort of a, so we, have a, we can have a high arousal or a low arousal where we're not excited or we are very excited, and then whether it's pleasant or unpleasant. And, uh, for example, if uh, we are not excited, uh, or, or let's start with that from the other end. If we are very excited and it's pleasant, uh, then, or, or when there's high arousal and it's pleasant, then, we, then it's excitement, we're at the upper end. Uh, if we have a high arousal, we're very, sort of, our bodies are very anxious, but, but it's unpleasant, then we are in an anxious state. Uh, and then if there is low arousal, and, and uh, it's pleasant, then it's relaxation. And then when it's low arousal and it's, it's unpleasant, then there's boredom. And we can switch between the mindset of a playful mindset and a non-playful mindset very rapidly. So something that is very exciting uh, 
can, t can become anxiety inducing if, for example, something that we thought was not dangerous turns out to be actually dangerous. So in our minds we sort of switch from uh, one mindset to another, from, from a playful mindset to a serious mindset. One way to describe this is that if you, if, if you think of a, a tiger in a cage, a tiger in a cage is exciting because there is something interesting and, and, and exciting, the tiger, but we are safe because there's a cage. Uh, if we encounter a tiger without a cage, it's, it produces anxiety. If there's only an empty cage, that's pretty boring. <laughs> and, and if there's no tiger and no cage, that could be relaxing. <laughs> so so the, the cage is sort of a metaphor for the magic circle or the protective uh, bubble that we, we, uh, 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 we experience when we are in a playful mindset. The question about the model and the clarification, um, would you define an area of the model as a playful mindset or is it? Uh, basically the, the, the sort of what Aptor uses is, is that there's a telic mindset which is a goal-oriented mindset and a paratelic mindset which is a playful mindset and, and the, uh, the continuous line is, is telic mindset, serious mindset and the uh, dotted line is the playful mindset, the paratelic mindset. Yeah. All right. And then there are certain things that we can do to increase arousal, that, that, that increase excitement. Uh, this is not a complete list, but, but, uh, but uh, sort of ex if there's exposure to arousing stimulation, for example, a naked body or blood, these are things that can be exciting or, or, or increase arousal. Fictions and narratives can be um, increase arousal. Challenge is something that many people find uh, increasing in arousal uh, exploration when there's something we don't know and we're sort of trying to find out what there is. Negativism, doing something that we're not supposed to be doing, crossing boundaries, uh, that can be exciting. Uh, cognitive synergy or bisociation, which means when we, when we see something in two different frameworks, for example, when an adult dressed, dresses up as a kid then there's sort of two different frameworks that we're looking at. It's sort of, it's sort of an adult, but it's also a kid. Or, or in a LARP context, there's always a player and a character. Facing danger, actual danger, of course, increases arousal. And then there are physiological uh, interventions like drugs or alcohol or tobacco or things like these. So these are things that increase arousal. And it's interesting to look at these from the point of view of LARP because uh, uh, LARP has many of these things sort of built in. Uh, many of these things are automatically found in LARPs. All right, then moving from playfulness, which is a state of mind, to playing, play or playing, which is something we do socially. That's a social thing. Uh, it refers, in my thinking, it refers to an action or activity. Uh, play or playing is visible. It can be carried out either alone uh, or it can be socially shared. And one of the things that we as humans are very good at recognizing is we're good at recognizing play. I mean, if some, someone is playing, uh, it's something that it's very easy for us to recognize. We even recognize in, sometimes in, in other species. Uh, we can look at uh, dogs playing or, or monkeys playing. Uh, and the thing is that sort of the way playing emerges is that usually playing is something that happens in a playful mindset. When you're in a playful mindset, you start doing something sort of uh, playful. And then if others join in, it can become a joint thing that you do together. But if you keep on doing that, if it, if it achieves a form, it, it's a playing that is recognizable then you can slip out of the playful mindset and you can, just, you can just continue doing it. You can pretend to be playing while you're not in a playful mindset. And for example, if you work in a kindergarten, garden, taking care of kids, playing with kids each day, I mean, you're playing, but you're not in a playful mindset, even though the kids might be. So you can, you can be playing while you're not in a playful mindset. Um, in our culture, uh, play is quite idealized and romanticized currently. Uh, there's this idea that sort of, sort of, when we play, we learn. I mean, 
playing is the child's work, and, uh, and, and as we play, we, we learn important things about life, and, and sort of sp doing sports build, builds character, and, uh, and, and sort, of, sort of the best kind of learning is something that happens sort of insidiously. You don't even notice it when you're playing because you're having fun, and, uh, and, and sort of play is seen as a positive force. And it is that, uh, but it's not only that, because uh, uh, like I said, play is, is, it lies outside the antithesism of wisdom and folly. Uh, it, it, is, it, is, it is not good or bad, it just is. So there is also play that is dangerous, illegal, disgusting. Uh, I mean, we, we do things that, uh, that, that while we play that we really shouldn't do. I mean, there's a line here on this floor which, is, which basically says that I shouldn't be standing there because then I'm in front of the picture, but there's a line here, I want to cross it. Yeah. Because it's fun <laughs> to transgress a little bit. Uh, I mean, there's all kinds of, there's deep play, dark play, illicit play, uh, anti-play. I mean, there's a number of words that researchers have used for this. For example, in schools, uh, there's, there's uh, play that where, where, where basically the, the, the uh, students are made to play. For example, during, during uh, gym classes or physical education, they have to play a certain game. So it's play to order. And then when they're playing amongst themselves, for example, passing notes or making jokes in the classroom while they're undermining the teacher's authority, it's illicit play. I mean, they're, they're, te they're uh, sort of uh, teasing in the situation. Also, bullying is something that can be seen as one-sided play. If you, if, you, if you catch somebody bullying another kid in a schoolyard and you ask the bully, why did you do that, the bully usually answers, it, it, it was just play. Of course, we believe the victim because sort of the bully has broken the rules. Uh, but what if we take the bully by his or her word, usually his word, that, that he really was playing. He just wasn't playing with someone. He, see, he, was, he was using somebody else as a tool in play. That can still be play, even though it's not nice. But there's other things like uh, uh, going uh, drunk driving on a dare or having unprotected sex for kicks. I mean, there's all kinds of things we do that we know we shouldn't do, but it increases arousal and it, it's... it's uh, uh, it, 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 it is play in a way as well. Uh, play is also deeply connected to creativity and culture. There are those who feel that, that sort, of, sort of all culture begins in play and play and playfulness is at the heart of creativity, art, innovation, improvisation, uh, creative destruction. And that's also again true, but play is also terrible and play can also be repetitive. We do things that, that uh, we really shouldn't while we play. And then there are sort of those, those, those play forms that are very repetitive, that if an animal engaged in such behavior, like Candy Crush Saga, sort of every day for an hour, I mean, that would be, that would be seen as a, as, as, a, as a compulsion. For example, when, when you have cows, uh, or, or young cows or calves, uh, they do this thing with their tongue that they play with their tongue, and it's it's play. But when they grow older, and if they're if they're in a, in a, in a very small area where they live, they sort of start compulsively using their tongue, and it's no longer play. It's just something that they sort of must do. So so in animals, we wouldn't uh, call that play anymore. But there are repetitive games uh, that we recognize as play. Another thing that is important to notice is that play has no function, uh, it, or it doesn't have any single function. I mean, there's, I mean, screwdriver has a function. It is something that has been designed by humans for a specific purpose. It, it, it exists for a, a clear purpose. But play doesn't exist for a specific purpose. So uh, we often assign functions to play. We, we say that we are playing for this reason or for, or for that reason. Uh, for example, uh, uh, we play to learn, or we, we uh, uh, play to teach, or, or, or there are sort of we play to create, or there are all kinds of functions that we can assign to it, but it doesn't have an innate function. It's something that humans attribute to it. Uh, so, sort of to sum, to, to sum up what I've said so far, 
sort of playfulness is a brute fatigue. It is something that exists in animals. Uh, uh, and playing emerges in playfulness. But when we start doing that socially with others, uh, it becomes, it, it, it starts to uh, uh, assume a certain shape. And, and as the shape is, is, uh, comes about, it's possible to engage in play without being in a playful mindset. Uh, and different, we have different cultural conceptions of what play is. Uh, uh, we sort of we can we can discuss certain things as, as play or not play, and it, this, this, uh, uh, different, this, there are differences between countries. But uh, if we look at playfulness as the source, uh, uh, that's how it works. Okay, how am I doing with time? Still five minutes. Oh, okay. I'm going to skip a few. All right. So how do we get from play then to games and LARP? Uh, games and toys are basically tools for play. They're something that we use uh, to, 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 um, to give a form to play. So once the play has, has uh, rules and it becomes something that, uh, that uh, uh, sort of we can look at without the actual activity, then we can talk about a game. And then it can take a physical shape like a Rubik's Cube. And there are all kinds of sort of socially materially in, uh, institutionalized playfulness. Uh, like, I mean, games are the obvious example, but toys, playgrounds, puzzles, sports, simulations, but also things like sport equipment, art supplies, costumes, and even going to things like rituals, tools, uh, fictions, competitions, and even performances. So LARP uh, uh, obviously has a basis in play, and often we are LARPing in a playful mindset, but LARP is institutionalized play because we, we, as, a, we as, as a collective recognize what the rules are and we know how it works. We, we share an understanding of how that play works. It's not pure play in the sense that you can't just do anything because there are clear, clear limits as to what you can do while playing. Also, it's important to po point out that playfulness is not the opposite of serious, even if uh, playfulness is the opposite of goal-oriented. You can still be seriously engaged in whatever it is that you're doing without it being goal-oriented. I'm going to skip a few slides again. Uh, so LARPing has a basis in play. But players need not be in a playful mindset when they're playing. In fact, especially game masters or game organizers often are in a very serious mindset. They have a goal where they just want it all to work. Of course, they slip into playful mindset from time to time as well. Uh, then we, LARPs usually also have an assigned function. They exist, for example, for entertainment, or they exist for teaching, or they exist for exploring a certain theme, or whatever, whatever function we've assigned to it. Uh, and LARP as a form is quite playful in the sense that many of the methods that Aptor listed as increasing arousal are sort of built in into LARP. Uh, uh, and, uh, I and, and in a way, sort of seriousness and playfulness uh, don't cancel each other out. And especially if we think about, for example, political LARPing, it can actually sort of using a serious topic can increase arousal because if, especially if we are using a forbidden topic or exploring something that we sort of shouldn't. So it can be exciting. Uh, With uh, sort of serious games and serious play, if serious play is possible, so sort of there's, there's lots of usages for, for teaching, simulation, psychodrama. LARP is also used for customer service preparation, military exercises. And these are usually sort of, sort of uh, goal-oriented uses of role enactment, of taking a role in a fictional setting. But they are very LARP-like. I mean, they are. In, in many ways, LARPs. So again, LARP doesn't need to be playful, although in the, even these, playfulness often slips in. Another thing to think about LARP is that when we think of, of, of the, what the animal researchers said about what kinds of play there are, uh, all of those forms are again present. I mean, the body of the player is extremely important in LARP, so it, it is embodied. We are often doing it for, for the visceral uh, ex experience or feeling in it in our body. We are also often using props and we're doing it socially. But of course, there are 
uh, more complicated uh, complicated forms of uh, of play that are not that uh, widespread in the animal kingdom outside of humans and those are things like uh, rule-based play and uh, pretend play. <laughs>